Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 676 of the podcast and it is Thursday 23rd of February 2023 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Tim Boucher about some challenging topics around AI and this is certainly a thought-provoking episode. We discuss misinformation, AI hallucinations and the responsible use of AI tools, as well as how Tim is using the very issues of AI to raise awareness about fact-checking. We also talk about his rapid publishing process and why he publishes on Gumroad rather than Amazon. So that's coming up in the interview section. But first, I have an introduction that goes further into some of the AI related news this week. Today's show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen who support these special in between episodes and make sure that I continue podcasting <laughs> with their emotional and financial support. And if you support the show, you get to join the uh, patron only Q&A where you can ask questions about all these things or anything to do with writing craft, business, publishing, book marketing and all the things. Join me at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. So in this introductory section, I want to talk about some of the news items that have arisen this week and actually fit into this episode very well. From the headlines, sci-fi publisher Clark's World halts pitches amid deluge of AI generated stories in The Guardian and lots of other places and hundreds of AI written books flood Amazon by The Independent and again reported other places. Now, I'm not, so, I'm not sure why people are surprised by this. And of course, this will only increase. But as ever, the headlines are clickbait and we need to have a more nuanced approach. Yes, there will be and there are scammers, spammers, pirates, get rich quick schemes and plagiarizers using these tools to mass produce crap and publish it quickly. But that is nothing new. People who do this kind of thing have always done this kind of thing. Everything I have ever written, recorded or produced in every format has been plagiarised, pirated, stolen and republished elsewhere. I used to try and stop it and I I still do make an effort when someone literally steals everything and this episode itself will be stolen (laughs) within minutes of it being posted. But it just takes too much time to try and stop it all. So instead, I focus on creating value for my true audience, all of you, (laughs) and that's where I put my energy. Now, this happens to me, and I am a mostly unknown author in a tiny corner of the internet. The most famous books, blogs, films, music, all of the rest get pirated the moment they emerge, or even before release if they're leaked. Humans are the problem. But of course, AI technology enables this to be done at scale, which makes it more of a problem. But again, this is nothing new. Have you checked your email spam folder lately? Are you aware of how much content farm crap that the Google algorithm filters out when you search? Do you know how much content moderation there already is on the internet? Are you aware of all the scams that go on even in just our little author corner of the internet? Check Writer Beware for years of them, most of them prior to generative AI, with many more to come, I'm sure. Do you know how many times Amazon has been flooded with spam books? And in fact, that <laughs> the word flooded, literally it's over and over again. It's used in headline after headline for years. And I think it's because I've been around so long now that I see this over and over again. Have a look at David Gochran's blog for a glimpse. For example, Scammers Break the Kindle Store, headline from 2017, and Kindle Unlimited, a cheater magnet from 2021, and a whole load more. And David doesn't even blog that much anymore. He used to do a lot more. On The Guardian UK in 2018, fake books sold on Amazon could be used for money laundering, 
and in 2019, plagiarism, book stuffing, click farms, the rotten side of self-publishing. Because yes, we've heard this all before. The tsunami of crap all over again. Back in 2011, J.A. Conrath, one of the early and most successful indie authors, wrote a blog post entitled The Tsunami of Crap. From that blog, some people believe that ease of self-publishing means that millions of wannabe writers will flood the market, that word flood again, with their crummy e-books and the good authors will get lost in the morass and then family values will go unprotected and the economy will collapse and the world will crash into the sun and puppies and kittens by the truckload will die horrible screaming deaths or something like that. I remember that time well. I spent way too much time and effort trying to prove that an author could be serious about the writing craft and the business and that professionally self-publishing, being an independent author, was a valid creative choice and for many a sensible business choice. Yes, there was a tsunami of crap and there still is, but don't lump us all together. It is more nuanced than that. Eventually, we stopped talking about it and just got on with writing books and reaching readers. The success of the indie author movement attracted more authors, and now, over a decade later, the stigma of self-publishing is almost gone. In fact, we are collectively a huge chunk of the book market. As Michael Tamblin, CEO of Kobo, said at Frankfurt Book Fair in October 2022, one in four books that we sell in English is a self-published title, which means that effectively for us, self-publishing is like having a whole other penguin random house sitting out in the market that no one sees. It's like the dark matter of publishing. So the stigma may be gone for indie authors, but now it seems we might have to go through the same situation all over again with AI tools, because the situation is similar. There are a load of crap self-published books, as there are a load of crap traditionally published books, and as per Sturgeon's Law, 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> Pick an industry, any industry, 90% is crap. Have you changed your mind about self-publishing in the last decade? Are there other technologies you've changed your mind about? So think about that when we consider the ton of crap AI-generated books. But readers aren't stupid. As J.A. Conrath said in his original article, readers don't care if some moron uploads his 10 years in the making opus Me and My Boogers, a love story. They'll be able to avoid it just by looking at the crummy cover art, the poor description and the handful of one-star reviews. The same is true of the masses of AI books generated in one second or less, which are flooding the store. As with ev every other flood of crap content, Amazon, Google, Meta, all the companies will crack down. Those books will be culled, the authors penalised, and inevitably some real authors will get crushed by the hammer. But they will appeal and they'll be reinstated, as happens over and over and over again. There will also be regulation, safety guidelines, legal shifts and guardrails added to the technology in the coming months and years as things develop. For example, we had Microsoft Bing's Sydney for just a few weird days and now they have already added in guardrails to stop it getting too creative, as reported in lots of places and links in the show notes with evidence of all of this. Like fire electricity and the internet in general, AI is both a tool and a weapon. It's our job to engage and help shape it for the better, because it is not going away, and the usage and applications of AI will only increase and accelerate. Compare the internet of 2003 with the internet of 2023. The impact of AI will be much greater than this. Read AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future by Kai-Fu Lee and Chen Chu Fan for a glimpse of the possibilities. So what about Clark's World and other smaller companies, agents, publishers, journals, etc.? 
Well, every company and publication will need to apply filters of some kind. For example, I am a one-person business, and I already use a premium paid spam filter and a premium paid contact form on my blog because I get hit by hundreds of spam comments and messages per day. Even these things don't get rid of them all, but at least it gets rid of a lot of them. These types of filter products will emerge for spam AI content, and that will help somewhat. There may also need to be a submission fee, even just one cent or one pence or whatever the tiniest <laughs> amount could be to submit to a magazine or an award or join an organisation or even to publish on Amazon or some of the other services we take for granted are free to publish. Some say that would prevent marginalised writers from submitting, but there could also be an appeal process or a fund set up so that people could apply for that so it isn't an issue. Some say it's against the spirit of these free submissions and free organisations and free everything, but times have changed, technology has changed, and business practices need to change too. Back to J.A. Conrath's blog post. He ends with... If you're really worried about readers being subjected to crap, here's what you can do. Don't write crap. So now we come to the authors who love to write and create and who want to reach readers and who want to use technology to help them do that. Use AI tools responsibly to create great art and run a better creative business. There are real human authors right now using AI tools to create better books and to run a better business. I am one of them, which is not a surprise to regular listeners or readers, as I have been talking about AI since 2016, and I wrote a book about the potential impact in 2020. Usage of AI tools is a continuum, and we all sit at different places along the spectrum. We are already a diverse group, and each person is using the tools in a different way. For example, some only use AI tools for generating sales descriptions or ad copy, or maybe for AI-narrated audio. Others are using it to generate finished words and images, and editing and shaping those according to their creative direction, as Tim Boucher does in the following interview. I have been writing for publication since 2005. I first self-published in 2008, and every year since, I have learned about and used new tools that help me improve my craft, write better books, and run a better creative business. I embraced blogging and selling e-books, which were just PDFs back then, before the international Kindle and the iPhone made mobile and e-reading popular. I started podcasting in 2009, way before it went mainstream. I jumped on YouTube and Twitter and used print-on-demand for print books and later paid ads and then tools like Vellum and ProWritingAid as they emerged and many more. The tools I use now in 2023 are almost completely different to the ones I used in 2005 when I started out and many of the tools I use now are AI-assisted. If you use Grammarly or ProWritingAid, or you use Amazon, Meta, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter or Google for social media, search, publishing or shopping, you are AI-assisted. And in the next few months, if you use Microsoft Word, you will be AI-assisted. So please, let's distinguish between humans who will spam and scam and plagiarise and want to get rich quick and those of us who are genuine writers who use AI tools as a collaborator, brainstorming partner, marketing assistant and other things to help us create what we want to, in our voice, with our creative direction, and to reach readers with our books. I remember being attacked for my publishing choices back in the tsunami of crap days, and this feels like that time all over again. The fear, vitriol and personal attacks make me just as upset and make me want to stop talking about this stuff in public because I am just another human wanting to make my art, wanting to reach readers and wanting to make a creative living. But back then, I also felt so excited and energised and empowered by my choice to self-publish that I wanted to share my lessons learned with others. 
and I feel the same way now. In fact, I am more excited about the years ahead. I am having so much fun using these tools, more fun than I've had in years. And I'm filling my journals with ideas sparked by these emerging technologies. I love this stuff. I've been saying for years since this is the most exciting time to be an author. And once again, I stand behind that. What a brilliant time to be a creator. I hope it doesn't take a decade this time for for it all to shake out. But in the meantime, as I did 15 years ago, I will keep writing the best books I can for my readers and continue to make a living as a full-time author entrepreneur, as an independent author, and I will use tools to help me do that. We are in the very early days of AI in everything, and as such, it is a chaotic time. But these tools are not going away, so you have to decide how much you want to engage. Personally, I try to come at everything with an attitude of curiosity and playfulness. I spend a lot of time laughing and giggling with ChatGPT in particular. It's like my inner two-year-old come to life, which is a lot of fun. You must find your own way. In the show notes, I've listed resources to explore further with lots of links. Check out the ethical guidelines for AI usage from the Alliance of Independent Authors, my backlist episodes on AI and the future of publishing at thecreativepen.com forward slash future, my book, Artificial Intelligence, Blockchain and Virtual Worlds, The Impact of Converging Technologies on Authors and the Publishing Industry, which I wrote in 2020. (laughs) And of course, it's only now starting to happen. And of course, I have, of course, I have the AI assisted author course, which includes aspects of ethics, copyright, bias, etc., as well as things on prompt engineering and all that kind of thing. You can find my courses at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. I haven't covered the copyright side here, as I covered some of the current legal cases in the introduction to episode 670, my last AI show on AI generated art with Oliver Alter. And I have an intellectual property lawyer coming on the show in the next few months to talk more specifically about that side of things. Because, of course, I'm not a lawyer, not a professional legal person. I'm just an author. (laughs) So thanks again to my patrons who support episodes like this. And if you have questions to ask me about this or anything else, please join the conversation with me at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview with Tim and continue the challenging conversation. Tim Boucher is a hyper-realist AI artist and writer specializing in questionable alternative realities. He's worked professionally in content moderation, policy, and counter-disinformation efforts on behalf of a major web platform, a blockchain protocol, and he has advised non-profits and governments on related issues. So welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. Sure. Well, I like to say that I'm living the American dream of becoming a Canadian. So I I was born in the United (laughs) States, but I've been up here now since uh, 2011, and now I'm a a dual citizen. But uh, I've always been interested in writing. I think the the more recent place that I started to really do it again a lot was in, in 2020, just before the pandemic, I started working on a novel called The Lost Direction. And that got me really excited again about this idea that I I could just be a writer, you know, I could try to do that and and try to make that work. It's not yet my full-time thing, of course, but that's where really the genesis of it. And that's the genesis of a lot of this other work that has come out after. Mm. So yes, tell us more about the Lost Books Project. What is it and why did you create it? Well, it's it's really just kind of my personal imprint that I use for some print books and a bunch of eBooks. But I've looked around a lot at, at publishing and professionally and self-publishing, and I like to kind of do things the way that that I want to do them and not have to compromise about the direction of, of the work. So making my own kind of imprint or press made more sense to me than trying to pursue publishing through another avenue. But Lost Books, it's it's primarily... Well, right now, my my current project is doing AI-assisted writing, but that's not the only kind of writing that I've done. As I said, the original book that I started with was all 
just normal manual writing. I don't know what we call that now, just regular writing, but um... <laughs> yeah. manual. I like that <laughs> manual writing, <laughs> but that sounds yeah. like handwriting. So you were just, uh, yeah. you were just a normal writer with no AI assistance. <laughs> <laughs> right, because in in 2020 or whatever, this was in its infancy still, and arguably still is. But it was kind of only over the last six months or seven months that I got really into the AI st- side of things because the tools started to improve. There's, they started to be more available, and there started to be image generation tools that were really exciting, like Dali and Stable Diffusion. And I've always been an artist as well as a writer, so having the opportunity to mix images and text. I think finally gave me the ability to produce a lot of things quickly that I've had that I'd had stored up for a long time because like writing to draw things by hand or or to paint or even do things digitally it's really time consuming so this has been a way for me to express all of these things that have been locked up for a long time. Hmm. So just be more specific about what the genre of yeah, most of yeah. your books are and also is the lost direction is that different to these other books you've produced so tell us more about that side yeah so the lost direction is is pretty much just like a straight up epic fantasy and then there were some follow-ons to that one of which was called the quatria conspiracy so that's sort of a a very tongue-in-cheek take on the world of the original book the lost direction proposing that It's not just a fictional story proposing that there was a hypothetical ancient civilization called Quatria that the whole thing is based on and that it's been covered up. So from that, I I kind of had this idea of of pursuing the presentation of my fantasy world within the context of like a conspiracy fiction. It's kind of switching it a, a bit to a pulp science fiction world where it's heavy on the world building, it's heavy on alternate realities, sort of the uncanny valley between AI and humans. And this word hyper-reality has come up a lot for me where it's this sort of postmodern idea that fact and fiction get sleep blended together. And I've really taken that idea and run with it. And AI tools have been really helpful in that regard. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting, so when you first pitched me, I went to your store and I was like, whoa, this guy is creating AI-generated books that are full of conspiracy theories. <laughs> and it kind yeah. of made me worried because one of the problems that we're now seeing with these AI tools is they are not fact. They make stuff up. And for right. us as fiction writers, this is brilliant. But also, you've worked in misinformation. Right. Um, you understand that. And of course, someone's conspiracy theory is someone else's truth. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So how do you feel about this issue, I guess, the sort of line between misinformation, disinformation and conspiracy theory? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the things that I want to talk about with my writing. It's one of the conversations that I want to to generate. And I've had a little bit of success with this. Uh, one of the first AI books that I put out was called Mysterious Antarctica. And it again, it followed this theory that there was this lost civilization and that they were in Antarctica and that I used Dolly to create images that were supposedly like people discovering artifacts, buildings and stuff in Antarctica in the 1950s. So from that, I got contacted for a couple of, of somewhat big fact checks because other people took my content out of its original context and repurposed it on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, all over the place, posting it as though it's a real historical thing. And I got fact check requests from Reuters and from France 24. And wow. there was another one. Yeah. So it, it showed me that like the way that these things travel, you know, you might start with one intent, but then other people sort of grab onto it and they kind of twist it and it changes. But this is the nature of stories and storytelling in general. And something I saw working in, in disinformation is sort of like these alternative models of how stories are told and stories are transmitted from person to person and they get distorted and changed over time. This to me seems like a, a very kind of modern take on on folklore and mythology. And there are good things and bad things about that. There are risks when, when you take a chance like that as an artist and create something and present it in a certain way that people won't take it in the way that you meant it, that they might distort it and look at it in another way. But I try to mitigate that somewhat by um, I, I try to only focus on sort of, I want to say fun conspiracies, like things that are low harm, 
potential. I don't want to do anything that's against people or against groups or that's too controversial or creepy. Like I try to keep it things that are are more on the light side. Like it would be fun if there was a lost civilization discovered in Antarctica. And what I've seen is that people are excited about this kind of way of looking at the world that it's like a what's maybe possible, you know, what's maybe true in opening up that kind of speculation and then also being able to talk freely about like what are the problems around these technologies. Like you said, they hallucinate facts and they just say things that are wrong or or that are offensive and that there needs to be that human layer on top of it too. And that's one of the things that I'm happy about having these organizations ask me for a fact check. I want to be able to say what I'm doing and why and start these conversations. So, mm. Yeah, just to explain to the listeners, I said no to you. I said, I don't want to talk about misinformation. And then you replied and kind of re-educated me on this. And actually, and now I agree with you. And we're having this conversation because actually we want to tell people that yeah. there there is this mis- misinformation. And what, I mean, what's crazy is it's not just the machine, it's also the humans. Right. And so having a human layer sometimes that's not the good thing because the humans are spreading it so humans right. humans seem to love these stories i mean when you talked about antarctica yeah. i mean i've read hp lovecraft at the mountains yeah. of madness and ancient civilizations these stories like you mentioned myths these are kind of part of our human mythos and so they spread and so to me the biggest thing that we should be doing is educating people around uh, how to discover what is true. And we yeah. have to behave in a different way. We can't just assume that what we search for or what we create or what we use with these tools is correct. And right. so it's almost like we need to educate people to go deeper than we're used to. And even we're like with Google, you know, Google's going to implement their Lambda model. So I mean, we, sh- we shouldn't be trusting Google anyway. I mean, I think we've yeah. all realized that over the years. So yeah, so I totally agree with you. This education of everyone around what we can trust and what we can't and that includes humans (laughs) right people people criticize ai technologies because they can be quote-unquote confidently wrong but it's like Mm. that's exactly what humans can do too so the same problems that that humans create are the same ones we're seeing in artificial intelligence but they're amplified because the technologies can scale and that's where risk starts to set in when something can be rapidly created and distributed and millions of people can see it in a short time. Um, so what what did uh, Reuters say when you replied, look, this is a fiction, this is fiction? I mean, they just, they published my comments for the most part, and there wasn't a lot of back and forth on that particular point. It's interesting. I think there's an issue with the fact checks that if you're somebody that you've gone really deep into some of this alternative conspiracy stuff, sometimes a fact check has the opposite of its intended effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's something I saw just in the world of moderation and the world of working with nonprofits and stuff is that even a well-intentioned fact check can sometimes backfire and then some people can take that as proof of a cover-up. So it's hard to communicate the thing that that is the answer. Like you have to, what you have to communicate instead is the tools to people to find the answer and be able to trust that they're going to try to apply them. And that's kind <laughs> of what I'm hoping to do is to be able to provoke that reaction. Like I see when people take my images and copy them in other places, and then people will come in and say, oh, that's fake. And here's why. And I like that. I like that people are coming in and they're just applying their like critical thinking on the spot, sharing it with other people and starting those conversations because maybe those people wouldn't be reached by a conventional fact check. But having this provocation helps to inoculate a bit against, I hope, some of the worst elements of that stuff. Yeah, there's lots to unpack there. I did want to come back to one of your blog posts where you were talking about creating these books. You say we basically are embracing the flaws of AI writing, the poor coherence, the inability to track narrative arcs, the tendency to invent facts. We want to recognize these artifacts as a feature, not a bug, (laughs) which I really, I really love that. And I kind of say that to people too about almost AI audio. We're not trying to make it human. So, I mean, once it is so like humans, we can't distinguish. That's probably more of a worry. So talk more about the flaws of AI and do you think they will disappear? (laughs) I mean, I think they're going to disappear. I think what we're seeing now is sort of like it's like the 1980s or 1990s of computing that like we'd have these like primitive graphics and that it would take a super long time to download over your connection your modem and i think coming generations of the technology it's going to just go faster and faster but 
to me, like one of the things that is sort of the ideal purpose of an artist is to interrogate the technologies that they use to create. And what I mean by that is that you don't just kind of like passively use them. You sort of actively use them. You question them. You try to push them to the edges and to the limits. And you just kind of like document that process of here's what I found when I went out exploring with this technology and some of it's good and some of it's bad. And here are the questions that, that it makes me want it to ask and to find the answers to. And I think it's really important for artists to get involved in the, in these kinds of new technologies because there's a real risk of having like a preponderance of only the engineering mindset. The tech bros. It's just yeah. the tech bros. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, like I, I'm someone that I've worked a lot in, in, in technology and platforms and everything. But when I look at job listings, it's always for engineers. And it's like, I get it. That's the bread and butter of these technologies. But it can lead to lopsided ways of thinking about the human impacts of the technology. So I really encourage like artists and writers and anybody creative to get into these tools and become experts in them, like take them apart bit by bit and make your own tools, make your own variations. Because when you become an expert, you can have a seat at the table in the conversation and the development of the technologies and you can help to steer it in a good direction. When you become an expert and you have this firsthand experience, it's much more powerful than just sort of having a theoretical knowledge of it. So, Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, obviously I've been talking about this for years now and I'm not, I mean, I'm re reasonably au fait with technical things, but I'm not a programmer and I'm not an engineer yeah. for sure. But I kind of think my feeling on this now is that let's assume that the AI is going to get better and better, barring some big disaster, <laughs> uh, things yeah. will get better and better. And that by ingesting so first of all, I agree with you, we should engage with these things, but equally the AI tools that ingest human artistic yeah. work. So given that it's ingesting, someone emailed me yesterday and they're like, oh, I I asked ChatGPT to role play as Joanna Penn and asked it to give me a pep <laughs> talk about my writing. And uh -huh. I said, oh, that's fantastic. Send me the screenshots. And it was like ChatGPT was me. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love that. I have no issue with that at all. And it was, but it was funny because it... <laughs> I kind of think, well, it's ingested all of me and I'm pretty positive. I mean, some of yeah. my fiction is quite dark, but I, I have to believe that the machine will ingest all the happy things as well as all the sad things and all the beautiful yeah. art as well as all the terrible <laughs> art. And that it hopefully will come up on the side of beauty and goodness and all those things. Although, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always a dark side, right? But I mean, yeah. so yeah. part of me thinks that, again, we're in such early days that it is only the technical people who are trying it and a very few artists and writers writers and whatever yeah. but that very soon this will be in everything and people will be engaging with it I guess in a more natural way rather than trying to talk to the technical people yeah and I still come across these barriers sometimes that I'm not an engineer but I've gotten fairly technically savvy about certain things but there's kind of like levels of involvement in some of these things like that I still haven't crossed like when people link to like a Google collab notebook I'm just like I close out the tab like I don't want to get to the point of having to become a programmer to do the next level of stuff but I think there are people that that's their skill set and that's their interest who might not be programmers but they might be able to make a real impact in that so I think it's worth it for them and there's a, a story that I like about the actor and director Buster Keaton that I think like when he first was presented with a movie camera, like what he did was he took it home or he took it to the hotel or whatever, and he took it apart piece by piece and figured out how everything worked and then reassembled it and then kind of went from there. So I think that's a really great way to approach tools and just like openly trying to discover them and experiment and there's room for reluctance because I, I understand that there are, are issues that need to be resolved, but don't let reluctance stop you from, from learning, from becoming educated and gaining experience. So. Yeah, I totally agree. And in fact, I'm absolutely fine because I get a lot of comments, obviously, <laughs> and emails and yep. things. And I'm absolutely fine if someone has a reasonable, educated view that is different from mine. What yeah. I object to is someone who has not even looked at any of these right. tools, like someone right. who's not even gone to chat GPT and tried yeah. anything and then is, is just 
saying how awful everything is. So just coming back to you being very open and you have a blog where you share a lot of your process as well around this. And I kind of dug into that. And I'm the same. Like I just had a blog post on my mine about with a demon's eye, which was a short story. Yeah. And I just list everything I used in terms of AI from images to text. And I was part of the ethical guidelines with the Alliance of Independent Authors. And one of the things that we're recommending is labeling. So I label like my AI narrated audiobooks have a little badge on them. You know, at the ed- right. end of all my books, I have this statement of AI usage. Now, I, I've i been doing that. And what's so interesting is I've been criticized for using AI. And then I've been criticized for more telling people that I use AI. <laughs> right. So it's hard, it's your... hard to win. Yeah, it is hard to win. One <laughs> cannot win. But personally, yeah. I'm staying on the side of labeling, even yeah. just to be aware of myself, like in 10 years time, will I look back and say, well, it's interesting that I was labeling things because clearly at the time, it was hard to know. So what are right. your thoughts on labeling and ethical and responsible usage of AI tools? Yeah. I mean, I think labeling is a really good and positive thing, because it gives people an idea of what to expect. It's like you know, if you're writing in a genre, you want to also label what your genre is because people might not like that genre. So I think of it as a sort of a subcategory of whatever your genre is already. But it's tricky because when people ask for labeling of content, they don't always know what it is that that their objective is. You find out that something is AI assisted or AI generated. What does that tell you? It, it says different things to different people and it's not necessarily clear what we should expect from that. And it's tricky too, because a lot of AI writing right now is hybrid human and AI kind of collaboration more than just purely AI generated, I think. And at a micro level, it becomes really difficult to say like, well, this part of it was written by AI, this part was written by me. Like, how do we do that technically as writers or within products that help us as writers that use AI. So there's a lot of unanswered questions there that I'm interested in because I like tech products and I like to try to figure them out. One thing I've thought about a lot is like, could we have sort of like a simple markup or markdown way to, within a text label, which parts are the AI generated parts? And one of the things I've landed on is there's a historical mark of of punctuation or an editor mark i guess more called the obelisk i'm not even sure how you pronounce it but (laughs) it's shaped in in different forms it's shaped like a division sign sometimes it's shaped more like a a percent sign and I, i think what it was originally used for was in like analysis of homeric texts that people would mark on the side of the manuscript or whatever using this symbol whether or not if if they thought a part of the text was maybe invented that it wasn't actually true to homer's original tale so there is a historical precedent for taking texts and marking them up to say this part is questionable this part we're not sure of the origin of it so i think there's something there that can be explored of of how can we do that and apply that at a really micro level within text at an inline so i think that things like that that writers who have their own perspective and who have historical knowledge of of analysis of text, they're going to have a lot to contribute that an engineer might not know about. So it's another reason for people to get involved. I think some of the other ethical issues I tend to think of, partly because of my professional background is in like risk and, and analyzing risk and then figuring out what do we need to do to reduce or to eliminate risks. So I, I tend to think of things like internet technologies in terms of harms. Is there a harm to specific, a specific person or to a specific group of people? Can you identify who they would be and what would be the harm? How harmful might it be? What is the likelihood? And things like that. And then sort of like that gives me a more concrete framework from which to decide about who's impacted and how much and why. And is it really something that I want to engage in or not? So I think something I'm seeing in, from artists and from writers who are hesitant to get into AI stuff is that I think people are sort of waiting for ethical issues to be worked out over time. And I think that's a legitimate position. But I also think that if you're waiting for things to become perfect and for all the possible problems to go away, you're going to be waiting a, a really long time and 
you're going to miss out on being part of the conversation to develop it in a good and an ethical direction. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, on that, the ethical things, I mean, we even <laughs> right now, as we record this, there's been all these articles about Roald Dahl, the children's author. I don't know if you've seen these about how his children's books are being rewritten to remove all anything considered offensive by uh-huh. a modern sensitivity reader. And I grew up reading Roald Dahl. I'm in my mid forties, a late forties <laughs> now. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I still remember them very well and they were like brilliantly offensive. And I loved that as a kid, you know? Yeah. And so there's a lot of hand wringing over this about, and it's all almost like every generation has its own different decision on what is ethical and what is right. So as you said, it will never stop. But I want to come yeah. back to that market in the text. That's definitely not what I meant because personally, you mentioned hybrid writing earlier. That's how yeah. I'm using AI is this very hybrid way. There is no way at the moment with my writing process, I would label like, oh, this particular word is something like this. Oh, no, it's... Like- you know, yeah, came up it's... with <laughs> <laughs> that. That would be too much. But what is interesting yeah. is there are some people who are using a lot more. But what I also think is we all edit, so it is much right. easier to label an AI edited, an AI narrated audio book because that is right. Entire, it's totally yeah. It's totally AI. Or my right. like my book cover for with the demon's eye. That image is generated by Mid Journey, so yep. that's easy. But I think text is is hard. Right. Uh, and then coming back on harm, you mentioned what is the harm. So let's come back to someone using chat GPT to generate text in the voice of Joanna Penn. <laughs> right. So some people would not find that acceptable. Some right. people would say you you should not be using my name in a prompt. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm delighted, but for some people that will indicate harm because that person could and look, everyone listening, you can go onto Chat GPT, you can say, write a blog post in the style of Joanna <laughs> Penn about seven tips for first time authors. Like literally, yep. you could go and do that now and you could publish it under your name. Now, does that harm me? Does that harm what right. where is the harm there? What do you think? I mean, I think that has to be on an individual basis for creators because it's going to be a, a different limit for each person. I think there there are risks there around like the right of publicity of of using someone's name or their likeness, or some people argue that style should be covered under that. If it isn't already, I'm not sure exactly at the technicalities, but and then there's also the risk of impersonation, I guess, that someone could use your name and then post something and then make it look like you you posted something that it wasn't you. I think it's just got to be figured out for each person. Except that's not correct because copyright law is not per person. Copyright law is copyright law. (laughs) So basically, the biggest question that is outstanding at the moment is, are these bots trained on copyright data? And clearly this, you can, it is. The question is, but copyright protects the expression of the idea, not the idea itself. So style is not covered. But if someone, people do every day, take my blog posts and repost, repost, we post them on their own websites, even though that's right. a breach of copyright. So yeah, I mean, this is this is difficult. I mean, coming back on the ethics, one of my yeah. ethical rules is do not use someone else's name in a prompt, whether yeah, that's... Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we agree no, on I, that. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree on that. And I, I wanted to, to mention that I don't, I just don't, I don't like it because I don't want to create work in the style of someone else. You know, like I want to create work in my own style or find a new style, you know, like I don't want to just go into stable diffusion or dolly or mid journey or whatever and say make something like this person it's like mm. well you did that but then what what's the next level i always want to i always want to know like where it's going what's going to happen next one thing i've seen that's i think a bit problematic in some of the products that are like third party user interfaces for some of these tools that if you apply a filter in some of those products it will automatically use an artist's name and it might not be super apparent that's being added into the prompt, but it is. And I think that's kind of like a fishy area that I don't really like. I would rather just be like more in control of the prompt itself and not try to imitate someone else and try to take it in a new direction. So I definitely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So even though I said I'm not bothered about it, it in general, it is not something that I think we should be doing because as soon as you use someone's name in a prompt, you know that machine is calling up whatever it has around yeah. that person, whether it, as you said, whether it's visual art, whether it's music, whether it's written work. So what I would say, I guess, is if it's in if the work is in the public domain, 
then I I don't have a problem. So, for example, yeah. I have said to ChatGPT, rewrite this in the style of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. But then taking someone like Lovecraft, well known as racist, misogynist, <laughs> all these awful things, but his right. writing was amazing. Well, then obviously I'm going to edit that and make. And if anything comes up that is offensive in our yeah. generation, then I'm going to edit it. So, yeah, I mean, I think we agree. We're agreeing on this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other things. Let's come back to your actual generation process. So your yeah. tell us how what tools you're using for your books yeah. and your covers. I use a variety of tools. And for this reason, it, also, we were talking about like the ability to track which parts were made by AI. It gets really difficult because I mix tools so much that it's just hard between like jumping between different tabs and stuff as I go through a text that... It's hard to figure out which part was written by which tool or which part was written by me. So I agree that there's a need to label it at a higher level. But the tools that I use in general have been, uh, there's a website called textsynth.com that they let you use a bunch of different open source models like GPTJ and there's another one, GPT Neo X and FairSec. Uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but... All of those are open source text generation models and they're accessible through that site. And the way that that one works is you enter a bunch of sentences or, or however much text you have and it tries to complete it. And then you can you can raise the temperature setting on this, which I like to do when I want to get like a curveball. And it starts to become like much more weird and much more like AI feeling the text. So I'll use that. Sometimes I will use, I've been using a lot verb.ai. I think you, you've you used PseudoWrite. I've tried that. Uh, yeah, I use yeah. PseudoWrite, but I have tried yeah. verb.ai. And as you're talking, I mean, people are like, oh my goodness, I haven't heard of that one. There are literally yeah. hundreds of these things, oh, probably there's, there's thousands. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But verb.ai I've liked because it's kind of straightforward. You just have a text, your text area where you're writing, editing, and then they use like forward slash commands like you might have seen in Slack or I guess probably Discord uses those too. But you can use like a describe command and then you can say what you want to describe or a, a continue command. And then there's like a reword option too. And you can tell it like reword, but change it to be more whatever. So I've used that one a lot and I, I like it because they, according to the CEO who I spoke with, they use not only GPT uh, 3 or maybe even 3.5 but they also combine it with some other sources, which I think are AI21 and some proprietary text that, that they use as corpus. So that one's nice because it's just like a simple editing environment and it's relatively quick. And it's I find that the text has a kind of a unique and different flavor than what I've seen in some other tools. I've also used a lot uh, character.ai. I really mm. like them. You can go and within just like a few seconds, you generate a character, describe what it is, and then you can converse with them. You can have it be like a character in your book or your story. And then you could also have it be a historical figure or like some secondary figure. I've used them that a lot, that site a lot to work on like press releases or to work on like more of the short expository writing that goes on around promoting a book, um, which I feel that I'm less good at or less confident in. And that that does a really good job because like I can have a dialogue with this tool that I say what I want and then it can like reconfigure, ask me some questions and it's not recreating everything from scratch. It's not coming up with the most creative things ever, but this act of like the dialogue, it, it lets you to get somewhere that you wouldn't have gotten if you hadn't engaged in that. So it's really good for that. Chat GPT is similar in that way. I think Chat GPT is kind of a different focus though. It's almost to me not as much meant to be a chat bot. It's more of like, I don't use it in that way as much. I don't go and ask chat GPT what it thinks about things, you know, like no, it's because no, it, 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 yeah. I just say, I, help me, like, help me rewrite this sales description right. to make yep. it more, more like a yep. best-selling thriller. <laughs> yeah. And I think it does a great job at that kind of stuff. Hmm. But I found that using chat GPT for like more of the creative writing side of stuff, it's a little bit flat sometimes yeah, well, the, do you know though as you know, again we're speaking on the 20th of february just yeah. before we got on the phone an article i just saw an article saying that they're going to in their advanced you know the paid service for chat mm -hmm. they're going to allow you to configure 
what you want the service to do because they're yeah. guardrails. I totally agree with you because I got on ChatGPT the very day they launched it. Like that yep. morning I was on yep. it. And what I was able to do around darker fiction stuff, like even guns, right? I write thrillers, yep. there are guns. Whatever people's yep. ethics are, that is in the thriller. And so I was like, I was like, wow, this is great. And then within a couple of days, I couldn't, I couldn't get it. Yeah, to, it would literally say, it. Yeah. you are not allowed to talk about guns. Right. It was like, seriously? Uh, and it's got more, people say like it's got more and more woke every yeah. week because they're having to shut down this and shut down that. But then people are like, well, what if I have conservative politics? Or what if I am someone who wants to write about guns? Or what if I am right. someone who wants to write about Marxism? You know, <laughs> so basically you right. have to, what they're saying is you'll be able to configure that. So I'm hopeful that it will mean I can get back to what it was at the beginning. We yeah. shall see, of course. No, I agree about a lot of that. And I think the thing for me that I found the most, just just as like as a fiction writer, is like I'll be like, okay, write a science fiction thing about this. And then it will be like, oh, as a large language model, I'm not able to blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah. look, look, I'm talking about <laughs> fiction. Like I'm not. I, oh, you, you, know, you have like, to say, you have to say, uh, <laughs> pretend you are an author or, right. you know, we're role playing yeah. where you're an author. <laughs> yeah. You have to like trick it. <laughs> yeah. And I totally understand their perspective that they've got now, I think like a hundred million users or something. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to satisfy the needs of that many people through a single tool with, a sort of a single configuration. And I think we've seen how that plays out and everybody wants something different from it. So I think that's going to be a, a good direction. We'll see how it gets deployed. Um, Any going other back, tools? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Going tools. back to the tools, I use I used a lot uh, Dolly 2 uh, at first for images. I think that their images have like a kind of a like a luminous quality to me. There's something about just like the colors and the light that I like when you get into certain aspects of it. I've used Stable Diffusion quite a lot too. I use specifically playgroundai.com because they let you generate a bunch of images for free or there's paid tiers. Um, and most of the time I start with my text first. I start with the title. I have sort of like a few different formats of titles that I use. I haven't mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but I, I'm up to like 67 titles now that are ai assisted um wait in how in how long how long did that take? <laughs> since uh like i think i started on august 4th so what year <laughs> last year 2022 yeah so it's i'm at a rate of about 10 10 a month a, a little bit less i should stipulate that like those are not super full-length books like generally they're between two and five thousand words and they include between like 40 and 100 images mm -hmm. Well, are so, you just doing this all day, every day? Or have you also created some kind of program <laughs> that is just doing it for you? No, I'm just like, I'm just like a, a voluminous writer. Like I'm, I'm very productive and I'm pretty efficient. And I've really nailed down a workflow that just lets me operate fast. And to some degree, it's a formula, but a lot of genre writing becomes a formula. And when you have a formula, there becomes a lot of freedom because you sort of know what you need to hit in your overall structure, in your writing and everything. And then you're free to explore all of this other stuff around that. So having sort of a structure, a workflow, a formula that I can rely on and fall back on has helped me to build exponentially what I would do just manually before. But my workflow in general, it's like I start with the title, I generate maybe a sentence or two about what this volume is going to be about. And then... I'll just go and start writing it in Verb or in another tool. And, and then I'll have like continue and I'll pop in between different tools and have things get expanded or changed and add another element. And then once I've kind of reached all the stuff that I wanted to reach in that volume, I will go and I'll do my image generations. And then I save those locally and I put them into Adobe Lightroom, which is a really great product that I think like few people know about probably for this use for managing like large sets of images and being able to kind of quickly go through and pare down out of all the image generations that I did into the the sort of the golden set that's going to fit best with this title and this topic and the vibe the mood and everything and then from there I go uh into vellum which is my favorite ebook writing and public publishing application by far it's just like really simple, really fast, very beautiful results, almost no problems ever with it. So I, I really love them. And I'll put everything into sort of short chapters and then I mix the images into the text. And I, I try to like 
have sometimes the images are reflecting the contents of the text and sometimes they're like really clashing about it like it will have sort of a different visual story or like a complementary visual story that sort of like highlights and expands on what's being presented in the text i should also probably note that structurally like what i'm doing as a writer is it's really a lot of world building and lore i have like very few um deep characterizations you know like sometimes books like there's just not even a character it's more like an encyclopedia entry about this fictional thing and this is something that took a rich precedent of that i think especially in like mid-century sci-fi of of having like dune or the foundation books that a chapter will start with like an excerpt from a fictional encyclopedia so that's kind of like the structure that i i play on a lot and it lets me incorporate like i said before these like flawed factual statements or these like inconsistencies and, and just present them as they are and not try to dress them up i think if you're doing other kinds of writing and you're using ai you might end up being more frustrated than than my use because it does have a hard time keeping track of characters and keeping track of narrative arcs. Like tools like Verb and to some extent some other ones are they're trying to solve that, but none of them have quite um, landed on how to do that. They, they are that. they're getting there though. Like Sudo yeah. right now has got yeah. a, basically you keep a little side note with things and then that gets incorporated into the next yeah. chapter but i will interview someone else who's doing that but just <laughs> i'm still i i can hear people who are listening they're still on 67 <laughs> books since august so let's look let's just be really brutal people will yeah. say tsunami of crap which is what just used to be uh -huh. thrown at self-published authors back in the day that's what we were told self-publishing is a tsunami of crap that will drown out real books real authors now i can, i think this is what people are saying all over again it's like 2007 yeah. all over again this is a tsunami of crap the quality is bad there'll be no real books no real artists anymore it will just be awful and it will kill off real authors etc cetera, etc cetera. so can what do you say about that i mean inevitably what you've said making 67 books they can be the top end of literature but still making them that fast is we are going to have an explosion of content like we've never oh, had yeah. before so what are your thoughts on this issue of quality and tsunami of crap what can authors do to make good art and also to stand out in a very what will become a very very crowded market <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I, I tend to follow this prediction by a journalist named nina schick she has a generative ai newsletter on substack that's worth following too she predicts that within a couple of years 90 percent of of content on the internet will be ai generated honestly i think it might be higher than that just because of the sheer fact that AI can do it much faster than people. And myself, like, I'm not using some program automated to automate the whole workflow. I'm just like using tools and then piecing things together. And I think eventually, like, people are going to automate the whole workflow and it's going to be more of a single button press. And I think that's in some ways it's bad, but in some ways, like, if the content that's generated is good, what's the major issue you know but of course not all of the content that's generated like that is going to be good well well just on that the major yeah. issue is that how will i find it well we all find it hard enough to make a living selling books mm -hmm. now when there is something like 21 million books on say right. the kindle store or no, I it's have impossible my, yeah yeah it's in, so and i have my <laughs> shopify store how are people going to find my shopify store so marketing and making money with your books is the problem so i guess it's let's super just hard. leave yeah, let, <laughs> yeah, but let's leave aside <laughs> yeah. the quality discussion because that yeah. is in the eye of the beholder. And I totally agree with you. I think within a very short time, you can, you will be able to press a button and output a best selling thriller or a romance according to whatever. But yeah. how are you thinking about it? How are you building an audience? How are you marketing? Yeah. How do you think we can stand out? I mean, I think like writing manually in this mode, as we said, like, I don't think that's going to go away. I think like people want to do that and people want to read that. So I think there's room for everything in the like the future that I imagine my ideal vision. It's like that if people want that, they can get that if they want things that are more AI generated or that are like custom tailored to their specific interest or whatever, like they'll be able to get that too. And I think 
there is going to be issues about like, how do you position yourself within that market? And I think that's where becoming an expert in how the tools work is going to be to your advantage. There's also a, an Alan Moore quote that I remember. I think he was talking about V for Vendetta, like his comic book, the original vision versus like how it was transformed into a movie. And he said, look, like the comic book still exists. Like it's always going to exist in that form. And the movie is this other thing and people can take it in, in the way that they take it. But he didn't see that conflict between the movie replacing the comic book because it's still there. It's still available. But I agree that marketing books is like one of the hardest things that I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> so what and are you doing? Because also you don't sell on Amazon, do you? No, I sell only on gumroad.com, which is probably weird to people. Um, just like briefly, Amazon is such like a, I feel like a controlling influence sometimes in my life. Like I, I'm always like buying things on Amazon that I feel like creatively, I don't want them to control my creative output too. There's something like creepy about that for me. If I'm wearing like Amazon sweatpants and watching Amazon shows and they own all my books, sort of, that feels kind of dystopian to me. There's so few corporations that that control so much of publishing. I think that's like, that's a really negative thing. So I think that being more DIY even than Amazon and carving out these alternative ways to sell it. It can be one way to differentiate yourself too, because you can't go on Amazon to get my books. You have to go through Gumroad. And when you do, I know exactly how much Gumroad is going to take. They're going to take 10%. And I also know that if you buy a book, I'll get your email address. Like I'm not, so far I'm not using those. I'm not doing a newsletter or anything like that to promote, but I can see like if someone bought a book, I can see like how many books they bought. Like I have a lot of people who they come back after buying one book and they'll buy like six more, they'll buy 10 more. I have one person who's bought like over 30 titles out of 67. So it's like, are they the tin, is... Mr. Tinfall hat? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, their interpretation is of it, I'm sure is going to be different than mine, but I don't want to like also enforce a single interpretation of the work either. But I think there's, there's benefit to having greater control over not just the tools of production, but also the distribution. Um, mm. I mean, I obviously talk about selling direct all the time, but still yeah. the question remains, how do you get people to find your Gumroad store? Right. So because my work is like a blend of fact and fiction, it rides on this edge of science fiction and conspiracy. Like I will post things to um, onto Reddit or my Medium account. Those are really the only two social media sites that I use anymore. And from there, like people go and they read the pitch page and if they're interested, they buy it. Like I'm doing pretty well compared to how I was doing when I was just trying to promote an epic fantasy novel. <laughs> yeah. Promoting an epic fantasy novel is probably it's one tough. of the, yeah, it's really, it's really hard. And if I had known that before, maybe I would have been more, more disillusioned before going in, but it's part of why I've modulated my approach. Like it's part of why. I got into this idea of the hyper real storytelling devices and just framing things in different ways and, and letting people make their own decisions about what's real and what's not. You know, like one of the things that's ironic is that my my original fantasy book, The Lost Direction, it sold far fewer than any of the other follow-ups about like the sort of the conspiracy framing of it, of the Quatria conspiracy or the mysterious Antarctica book. Like that has sold so many more. Well, that is a, that is a very mysterious Antarctica or mysterious Egypt or mysterious whatever. I mean, <laughs> I, people love I, I, that's the type yeah. of thing I buy for my research. I'll probably yeah, go it's, buy that it's you know, fun, for my research, you know? even though it's fake. It's still right. giving me ideas and I read books for ideas, but we could talk forever, but I feel like we're almost out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to ask you before you go, we've talked about a lot of things that are difficult a lot of things that are challenging yeah. for people but where do you think we're going because I really do think we're in super super early days like I said it feels yep. like 2007 this kind of iPhone moment when we were yeah. like oh well what do we do with that who needs a phone like that and this is like now so what's it going to be like in the next 15 years but what are you excited about obviously not 15 years away but what are you excited about what do you think is going to be happening I mean one of the things I'm most excited about is like okay, I want to reach 100 volumes. And I'm like feverishly trying to work towards 100 You'll volumes. You'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I calculate that it's going to be like maybe another three and a half months if I'm lucky and I can keep up the speed. But what I'm excited about is is eventually having another AI layer that can come and it can ingest all of my books um, 
and it can make like a map of all of my like my universe or my multiverse or whatever and it can say like these are all the relations between all the entities and the characters and the places and the here's a timeline of events and then it can reference the different sources and then it could even like highlight like okay there's a conflict between how this is described here and how this is described there and i think like once i can reach that level where i can put the work in there and then get these like next level interpretations and representations there's going to be like a whole new layer of storytelling that's going to be really exciting and mm-hmm. it just seems like an an inevitability that that will happen and i've already seen there's a tool called file chat that you can upload your documents to it and then you can sort of like conversationally query the contents of the documents so i think that's not going to be a super long way away kind of what i'm describing so, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I also think we talked about the problems of discoverability, but actually mm-hmm. AI, an AI over layer that can go actually find something for me that can right. actually find me fiction that I would love, with, yep. regardless of where that might be. I think that would be brilliant because it feels like at this yep. point in time, the Amazon algorithm is broken or it yeah. is gamed by ads or whatever. Yeah. So, And I feel as a reader, what's so crazy is I, as a reader for the last couple of years, really, I've found books in new ways. I've gone back to bestseller lists or I've gone back to yep. physical bookstores yeah. because I feel like the ad model has changed things and that the recommendations I get are not good enough. So yep. I want a better AI recommending me yeah. books. <laughs> I, I have the same problem with music on Spotify that like, because I listened to something a few times now, Spotify is convinced forever that this is my favorite thing. And I only want to listen to that from now on. And it gets very distorted, the recommendations. And it makes me feel that like, now I don't even like the things that I liked before because like Spotify is just forcing me on it. And I contrast that to a decade or two decades ago when I was younger. And like when my main source of new music and movies and books and stuff was from my friends, like people who I hung out with in real life, that would be like, oh, you're going to love this, check this out. And to me, that human element is never going to go away. But I think like you said, that over time, as the AIs improve, we'll get better recommendations and better ability to find the things that we're going to love um, and that are going to change your life. And I think one solution for writers is to be like super extremely niche because like as those recommendations improve and it's going to be easier for people who who follow that very super specific niche to find you. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So a combination of exciting times and difficult times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) For sure. But this is why, I mean, I said to Jonathan, my husband, the other day, I just love being alive right now because I I feel like we are, it's, we're kind of the, the, in the surfing, the wave analogy, we're kind of wobbling on these boards. We don't know what's (laughs) under the water. We're like, but it's really exciting at the same time. And I I think you feel the same, right? Excited, terrified, but yeah, yeah, yeah. this is amazing. (laughs) Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so where can people find you and your books online? Yeah, so the the books themselves, as I said, are on Gumroad. So if you go to lostbooks.gumroad.com, you'll find them. Or you can go to also to lostbooks.ca. There's a link from there. Also, I run a, a personal blog. I've rediscovered my love for just being able to be like true to my vision of something and not having to worry about how it appears on a platform. I just get to write it, be myself. So if you want to see that stuff, you can go to timboucher.ca. And I talk about, like you said, process. And I talk about the technologies of AI and how artists need to have a strong role. So if you're into that, into that stuff, go there. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Tim. That was yeah, great. Thank you too. Great. So I hope you found the interview with Tim thought-provoking and that my introduction gave you some historical context into how these technology shifts shake out. As much as some days I just want to step away from the conversation and get on with creating my own work, I can't seem to help myself discussing this in public. So more interviews and in between episodes to come. And if you find these useful, please consider joining me at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen and supporting these extra episodes. And you can also get the Q&A for patrons only if you join. 
back to the usual show on Monday when I'm talking about selling direct on Shopify and building a seven-figure book business with Pierre Gentil, who is also a poet. So that will be fascinating. And you'll also learn about a mistake I made. <laughs> And I kind of knew I'd made and I asked Pierre about it and he confirms that I probably should have done things differently. So hopefully my mistake saves you from making the same one. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.